I apologize for the recording quality of my microphone. On the rest of this episode, my computer decided to disobey me while we were recording and use the wrong microphone. I believe it's still listenable, but could have been a lot better. But I hope you enjoy this cover of Andrew Peterson's Matthews Bagats with Eric on the vocal and bass and me on the guitar. <laughs> Abraham had Isaac, Isaac he had Jacob, Jacob he had Judah and his kin. Then Perez and Zerah came from Judah's woman Tamar, Perez he brought Hezron up and then came. Aram, then Aminadab, then Nashan, who was then the dad of Salmon, who with Rahab fathered Boaz. Ruth, she married Boaz, who had Obed, who had Jesse. Jesse, he had David, who we know as king. David, he had Solomon, by dead Uriah's wife. Solomon, well, you all know him. He had good old Rehoboam, followed by Abijah, who had Asa. Asa had Jehoshaphat, had Joram, had Isaiah, who had Jotham, then Ahaz, then Hezekiah. Followed by Manasseh, who had Amen, who was Amen, who was father of a good boy named Josiah, who grandfathered Jehoiakim, who caused the Babylonian captivity because he was a liar. Then he had Shealtiel, who begat Zerubbabel, who had Abiud, who had Eliakim. Eliakim had Azer, who had Zadok, who had Achim. Achim was the father of Eliad then. He had Eliezer, who had Mathan, who had Jacob. Now listen very closely, I don't want to sing this twice. Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, the mother of Christ. Hello and welcome to Raise a Glass the podcast where we talk about the stories and storytellers shape us. My name is Eric Lintela. And I am Hunter Danson. And today, Hunter, we're going to be talking about one of my favorite albums of all time. Mm -hmm. Uh, Probably actually my favorite album of all time. Wow. Uh, Behold the Lamb of God. Um, But of course, as is tradition here at Raise a Glass, uh, first I got to know what's in your glass. Well... You had eggnog last week, and uh, as I'm generally slower to get in the Christmas spirit, um, I I now have a Christmas drink, which okay. I consider the the better version of eggnog, mm-hmm. which is coquito, uh, also known as Puerto Rican eggnog. Okay, which is uh, coconut rum. Sweetened condensed milk, evaporated milk. You kind of mix them all together and blend it up with some cinnamon, and it's uh, it's it's amazing. Uh, wow, that sounds like rum chata. Hmm. A little bit like that. That sounds that sounds amazing. I've never heard of that before. Yeah, coquito. Hmm. Well, I also kept in the Christmas theme, and one of my coworkers. I uh, just had a held a, a volunteer appreciation event at our work, and also uh, there were a couple extra things left over. And she gave me a um, homemade um, like mason jar full of hot chocolate mix with peppermint and marshmallows. All right. And so I am drinking um, uh, hot chocolate, um, hot mint chocolate, mint hot chocolate. Yes, that makes more sense. Hot chocolate mint. Um, the marshmallows melted, so I put whipped cream in it, and it's also melted. Um, mm. So that's a little sad, but <sighs> cozy. You no, know, some people don't like chocolate mint. Uh, are they? Are from you one this of those planet? people? 
Oh, I was worried for a second. Yeah, I don't know. Um, it, it doesn't make sense to me. They're amazing flavors. Why wouldn't you put them together? Who knows? Well, Hunter, in addition to that, uh, what are you raising a glass or pouring <laughs> one out for today? Um, I'm raising a glass to the American Red Cross, um, who, despite being uh, terminally understaffed, it seems like whenever the last two times I've gone to a blood drive, they're still doing it. Um, there's almost always a, a shortage. They always need blood. Um, I'm a, a, I'm a fairly common blood type, so I I have given over three gallons of my blood over my lifetime. Nice. Um, but I, I'm raising a glass to them. I think there's a shortage right now that's like an emergency, so... Uh, go give blood. They're all over the country. You can, they have an app that makes it pretty easy to schedule. Hmm. Um, American Red Cross. And I am pouring one out. Um, this is pretty petty, but, uh, you know, this is why we have pour one out. Um, for <laughs> the announcers of uh, American Ski Racing, Ah, races. Okay. Um, I uh, I used I raced competitively. I wasn't I wasn't amazing, but yeah, I raced in Vermont. I made it to to a states a couple of states races. Um, so I like to watch ski racing. I really like um, Michaela Schifrin. I follow her uh, career because she's kind of like the same age. And I actually raced on the same snow as her once. I hey, know. Uh, I was in. I wasn't anywhere near as fast, obviously, but it was, it was at a States race. And, um, I was there at the same time on the same mountain, but, um, when I watch these, these races, every time I sit down, I think I'm just going to watch the race. Just going to enjoy it. Not let these guys get on my nerves. Um, and I don't know, <clears throat> I assume that at least one of them has had racing experience, mm -hmm. but, I feel like they've been so long away from the sport that they don't mm. remember what it's actually like to ski race uh. because they make all of these assumptions about what is affecting the racers, uh, performance, you know, how fast they're going and, you know, they catch the big things. Like it's fairly easy to see if, they, if a racer puts up a bunch of snow on a turn, it's like, Oh yeah, they're going to lose some speed on the next few gates. But like they make all these assumptions about their performance and it especially grates on me when they announce on the women's racing, because I, they said this, uh, when they were announcing the Killington world cup race, um, he said, I've never seen a woman ski slalom so fast. Uh, and then he also said, I've never seen a woman ski GS that fast. And it's just like, why do you have to say that? And they literally never stop talking. Mm. Uh, so it's just, it, there are just so many factors that go into a race. I mean, you do your best and sometimes you're just not as fast and there's, there's so many different reasons why. And they, they always try to make it some kind of narrative and it, it just, I, I, I prefer to watch it in a different language because mm. I can't, <laughs> I don't like the, uh, U S announcers. Have you ever thought of just muting it? Yeah, but I like to hear, um, sometimes they do like interviews of the athletes after the, the course talking about their, uh, how they did and, and what they thought and stuff. And I like to hear the sound of the skis scraping on the, the ice <laughs> and, and all of that, but, uh, brings you in. Yeah. Uh, but man, I just, just let me watch the race. Anyway, <laughs> that was very long. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> I appreciate that. I actually, one of the things I liked about the most recent Olympics is I felt like it did a better job of bringing in a pro athlete and an announcer, a professional announcer together. And I've, I really appreciate when you have kind of the announcer filling the shoes of the, what in the world am I seeing? Um, but also like well versed enough to call some of the action and the pro talking about usually retired pro talking about kind of the level of complexity and the specific unique pieces that were put into a particular performance. 
Yeah, they had Ligeti for uh, the Olympics, and he was he was great. I love Shred Ligeti. <laughs> anyway, what about you? What are you raising a uh, glass? I feel like out? you're raising a glass and pouring one out. Also, like, usually are are or raising a glass in particular are about like other things in the world. Um, <laughs> and so mine uh, typically are much feel much more selfish, as is the case today. <laughs> Um, but I'm raising a glass to grandparents, um, specifically Caleb's, uh, my Mm. son's grandparents. Um, and, um, well, first of all, all grandparents are amazing. Um, I heard it said once that the reason grandparents and grandkids love each other so much is they share a common enemy. (laughs) I think it's hilarious. Um, I, I, I also think it's not true. Um, but most of the today, time. yeah, most of the time, that's true. Uh, today, my mother and my father-in-law came over um, to help out um, while Melanie was at work. Um, my father-in-law was here to help me on a project that I've been working on uh, that we really, honestly, the two of us have been working on to put up um, like a breakfast bar, like table type top over uh, a spiral staircase we have in our kitchen, which is a very strange space to have a spiral staircase, um, as you know, uh, uh, to make it much more kid, kid safe uh, mm-hmm. and also much more practical. Yeah. While also not losing the practicality of, or the functionality of the spiral staircase. So my father-in-law was helping me with that. And my mother came over and my father also said he could um, and watched Caleb for a couple hours to, to give us the space to do that. And so, so grateful for, for them, uh, for grandparents, for for nanny and granddad and grandma and grandpa, uh, a special mm-hmm. call out to all of you, to both, to the four of you, uh, and your grandson loves you very much. <laughs> and then following your pettiness, I am pouring one out for tumbleweed. Um, <laughs> you know, the things that used to go around the desert. Well, we have a lot yeah. of those in our own home. Um, but they're made out of cat hair. Oh, um, I don't know if you have any uh, cat hair tumbleweed in your your home, um, but it is. I feel like every time I'm walking up the stairs or walk, we've got wood floors everywhere. So every time I'm walking around, I just see these little clumps of fur that if you if you walk too quickly past them, they'll blow along next to your mm-hmm. feet. And actually, before we jumped on the call, I picked up three or four of them uh, right behind where I'm sitting. And it's like, oh, I guess I'm going to bring these into the garbage. Um, so that's me. Uh, I was actually at a, a, an amusement park once. And you know how like all of those, the cottonwood um, pieces, like often like, will, like co- collect together on like mm-hmm. pavement and stuff like that. I was at an amusement park once and some guy put a lighter up next to like this group of cottonwood that was all around and it would mm. it lit up like, like match, like flat paper, match paper. Um, there's a, there's a word there that I, I don't really know what the match paper probably. I don't know. Or, I've heard, I feel like I've heard fly paper before. Fly paper. Well, fly paper. It's not fly paper sticky. What's the thing that magicians do? You go like that. It lit up like that. Oh. And uh, it was really cool. Also super unsafe. But I assume that's what um, people in Westerns would do with tumbleweed. they just like light it on fire and it'd burn. I haven't tried that with cat fur. It sounds like that smelled terribly. I think I remember like Idaho had a tumbleweed problem. This, I don't, I remember it was Idaho. It was somewhere out West. They had like, hmm. it was almost like an invasive species. That's um, so funny. And it like, it was causing accidents and stuff. I'll have to fact that fact check that, but huh. it's um, no joke. I didn't know that tumbleweed was sentient. Um for living and breathing. Anyways, that's um my attempt at pettiness. <laughs> um now it's up to you to decide who is more petty, Hunter and his conversation about announcers for ski races or Eric and his conversation about cat tumbleweed <laughs> call in now to five, 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 hundred Danson. That's five, eight, five, 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 five. 
what, what are the letter, numbers, numerical things for Hunter? Um, I don't know them off the top of my head. Um, I haven't used that kind of phone in a long time. <laughs> I was looking at the number key on my uh, on my computer and hoping that it would tell me. <laughs> it didn't. It didn't just show up. <laughs> but now that they're bringing flip, phone, flip phones back, I hope they also bring that with them. Yeah, well, they're not really... The, the same. It's it's basic. It's just a smartphone that you fold in half. Well, it's a tablet that you fold. But will in it half. bend? Uh, that's what people were asking before I got my Google mm-hmm. Pixel a couple years ago. Like, yes, every phone will bend if you put enough pressure on it. Yeah. Wasn't there like an it was an iPhone or the Google phone or something like that that was bending? Um, oh, it was an iPhone. Yeah. Okay. It's stupid. Uh, that was a longer, <laughs> irrelevant, tangential uh, intro than I feel like we often have. Or maybe we always have that long and meandering of a, an introduction, yeah. and I just uh, don't, don't pay attention to it. Um, but Hunter, we today t- uh, are talking about Behold the Lamb of God, which was an album written in 2004 by Andrew Peterson. Um, A lot of the aspects of it were co-written with him and other authors um, and and musicians. Um, And this is now what celebrating its 18th anniversary. It is a Christmas album. Um, I actually like to think of it as an Advent album um, that walks through the story of Jesus. And instead of walking through the story of Jesus, starting with his birth, it starts with Passover. Well, more specifically, it starts with somebody gathering in the family to share a story about a lamb. And then it follows through. from Passover to um, time of Moses uh, and um, large parts of the people of the Israelites, the Jewish people's history um, up until the foretelling of Jesus's birth, his lineage, um, his, his birth um, and the celebration that happens afterwards. And I kid you not, I listen to this album almost every single day during Advent. Um, And I've been doing that for a few years now, Uh, probably for at least three or four years uh, every day. From from shortly after I was introduced to it, maybe a year later, I started listening to it every day during Advent. And and often I'll start in like November, um, Mm -hmm. getting ready, getting my heart ready. So that's just a little bit of a, a piece about it. Um, it is an album, again, written by Andrew Peterson, who's one of my favorite artists. Um, in general, but there's also many pieces that are written with him and many other people and that are um, collaborative pieces um, that are then performed by different groups of people. So. We're going to talk about more. I want to hear your thoughts about it. Um, I can't remember if I've made you listen to this before or if this was the first time you've heard it. Um, it's, tell me. It sounded familiar. Um, this was the first time I did, I think, like an intentional listen through it. Okay. Um, I can't remember when I was introduced to Andrew Peterson. I think it was you. But I also remember uh, discovering the song In the Night. Mm. Uh, which is not on this album, but if we have time, I'd like to talk about it because I, I love that song. We can um, talk about a couple of Dancing in the Minefields. Oh, I love that yeah. song too. <laughs> I was 19, you were 21. The year we got engaged. <laughs> and everyone said we were much too young. A lot yeah. of singing happening on this album, this uh, episode. I promise mm-hmm. you. Yeah, we already had some. <laughs> Again. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you all enjoyed that as much as we did um, making it. Um, actually, that's not the first time we've made uh, we've we've performed that. Yeah, I remember we did it with with Jeff. 
I yeah. Have to, oh, it shall not be named. Uh, and we did it with what a guitar, bass, mm-hmm. and banjo. Yeah. And we all took we both we took turns alternating who was singing. Yeah. That was one of my favorite favorite things we did at <clears throat> college. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> we actually practiced on the the stage, mm-hmm. like the main stage. Ah, oh, good memories. Um, but sorry, first time you yeah. gave an intentional listen. Yeah. Um, and I think I think this album highlights one of the things that I love about Andrew Peterson, which is his songwriting. Um, mm-hmm. And the way that he writes overtly Christian lyrics um, in a way that I can listen to. (laughs) Yeah. Oh yeah. No, we, we have to talk on this episode about, um, art and Christian art. Um, yeah, we need need to talk about that on this episode. Um, because I mean, I, I play in, in church. Um, I've played, you know, and, and you do worship music, contemporary worship music, like Hillsong and Bethel and that kind of stuff. And, Mm -hmm. and I appreciate it in the corporate setting of worship and people singing together, but I don't listen to it on its own. I don't, I don't think it's particularly creative. Um, you know, there's exceptions, there's some songs, but like, it's just, they use a lot of familiar metaphors. Um, and to me, it all sounds the same. It all sounds a little like you too. Um, which, you know, you too is fine, but, uh, I strongly disagree with that wording and what you just said. I, I think that's just blatantly not true. I think you two's music is very much more in line with where the broader cultural culture is at, um, than, um, contemporary Christian music. I mean, maybe it's because I listen to the guitar parts a lot. And um, I feel like a lot of the Christian guitarists try to emulate the kind of um, this the sound of the edge, where it's kind of this clean delay sound. Um, there is distortion in some of the larger parts, but I don't know. I don't I don't listen to it that much, so I maybe I'm giving kind of a biased uh, take on it, but. What I love about Andrew Peterson is that he tells it in a fresh way. I do agree with that. And I think one of the songs on this album that um, is a great example of that is the O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Yes, I thought you were going to talk about that. Okay, Um, tell me. It starts out and it it has the melody of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. That's very familiar. And then, and it, and it does the kind of intro with the guitar. And then it starts with this kind of uh, bluegrass guitar picking to provide kind of a background. And then it comes in with, it sounded like a mandolin or something like that. Mm. Um, and it plays this, these variations on the melody where it still follows this, the same basic notes, um, but it switches up to timing. Mm. And so it's, it's a song that you have heard a lot. If you've, if you've been in church, you've heard of Como Come Emmanuel, probably. Even if you haven't um, been in church, yeah. it is on like the Christmas song like tour. Yeah, Why it's not? a, it's a it's a very well-known hymn, um, but it's very interesting to listen to this, this rendition of it because it's unexpected. Um, Mm -hmm. It takes your expectations and it uh, subverts them in a really creative and interesting way. And I, I, that's how I feel about Andrew Peterson and his songwriting because it sounds familiar in that it sounds like a lot of the hymns and some of the, you know, other famous Christian music, but it's also very fresh. 
uh, and it does yeah. things that you don't really expect. Well, and you can. I mean, this is his most overtly Christian album, um, and it's you know because it's about the story of Jesus. Like, I think his work is actually. You brought up you two earlier, um, and I, I don't think they're similar at all, like in the way they play music or anything. But I think there is a similarity in that you do not need to, you know, love Jesus and go to church on Sunday in order to love their music and sing it and want to go to their concerts and mm -hmm. read what they write and listen to them in interviews. Um, which is different from the other pieces you were talking about of of the the songs that you'd sing on a Sunday in, in many churches. Um, which I have to say I do listen to um worship music. Uh, regularly and by worship music, I mean contemporary Christian music. Um, cause I think it's important to realize that worship music is not, is not just confined to pieces that we corporately sing together on a Sunday. Um, yeah. even though it, that was, our, that definitely is <laughs> worship music. It's not the, the only aspect of worship music. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is this doesn't feel at all like that. So I, I was introduced to Andrew Peterson in two thousand and fifteen. Mm -hmm. Um the the winter and spring of two thousand fifteen. And for the last seven years I've been listening to Andrew Peterson regularly. And it was I think it took a, a couple of years before I was introduced to Behold the Lamb of God. Um but as soon as I heard it, I was I was stuck on it. Mm. So Hunter, before you start asking me about the ways in which Andrew Peterson, Behold the Lamb of God, have shaped me, let's let's touch base a little bit more about that art and Christian art. We've talked about it a little piece, and and this is a piece that I think it might be part of the reason we have this podcast um, <laughs> is. Yeah. And we land in different probably parts of a, a, a larger spectrum, but similar, pretty close to each other. Mm -hmm. um, and that so many, w what I've noticed is there ha is a distinction uh, in quality often between art, and this includes movies, it includes music, it includes I mean, any type of art and storytelling that is um, distinctly Christian and art that is not. Um, so just think about the last time you watched. I, yeah. A yeah. Sorry. I, I guess I wouldn't so much say quality because a lot of it does actually have like have quite a high production value. Like if you listen to like Bethel or Hillsong and everything, totally, the totally. mixing so is amazing. I think it's more like style and what is valued. See, when I say quality, I'm thinking not the production quality because I agree. Production okay. quality is pretty similar. I'm thinking about the – if we're talking about music, the, the, the depth of the chord decisions and the chord progressions because it's created for the com lowest common denominator of something somebody <laughs> can play on a Sunday. And I, yeah. I mean this. Like it's, it's, it, and I love playing worship music. I – love playing worship music on Sundays. Like I play in bands, like, you know, worship bands, uh, play the bass. I love it. And I tell people that playing worship music is like playing Green Day. <laughs> you have your four or five chords and that's where you start. Mm -hmm. And if you play, you know, your basic patterns, your, your one, four, five ones um, with a few minor chords in between, like, you got it. Um, and then mm -hmm. your bridge, you know, and then go back, you know, the bridge is what five, one, four, you know, or something <laughs> like that. Um, and, and this is, this is where the, this, and, and that's distinctly different from where a lot of other, and this is not always the case for every music, but like in general, I've noticed this in, in, in that type of music. And, and let me just share a caveat to this. Um, I also tell people that once you can, once you understand Green Day music or understand, the chord progression of a worship song, you can do whatever you want to with it, which mm -hmm. is amazing. It, it creates this template where you have so much flexibility depending on the 
um, direction of the uh, the the leaders of of the group you're playing with, and it changes depending on the individual um, to do what, with it what you want. Like, and you can throw in runs, you can throw in um, you know really anything um, to add to that complexity. But the base is so sparse in its depth of. <laughs> And, and again, I'm talking yeah. about the musicality. Of the, I love the right. words so often, like, and I, I think that many worship songs dive deep, uh, but the, in, into some theological pieces. So that's what worship music. Um, thinking about the last, like, the different Christian movies and shows I've seen, and and I want to make a distinction here of the Chosen. I've seen a few episodes of the Chosen. I want to watch more of it. Um, the quality of it, the, the episodes I've seen, is just incredible like not just the production quality but the quality of the storytelling mm-hmm. um and we're gonna we have we are g- going to bring on storytellers onto this podcast hopefully and in, in future seasons who are christian um who are breaking molds i think um and who are doing it in ways that might not be overtly christian and this is a, a piece that i've noticed is the difference th- there's this i mean I'm just thinking about some like fireproof and other movies I've seen that are, are Christian movies. And like, I've enjoyed many aspects God's of them. Dead. Yeah. Like oh. I love the newsboys. Um, I'm not as big fan of news talk. Um, even though I love Michael Tate, that's my, what I call <laughs> newsboys with Michael Tate. Um, I, I love DC talk. I love newsboys. It's just, it's different. And you know, I was raised on newsboys. Um, I actually sing newsboys song, one particular newsboys song to Caleb every time I put him to sleep. Um, mm. But there's a, a, a distinction in quality um, in the acting and many of the storytelling aspects. And like you watch it and you're like, oh, I'm watching a Christian music movie. Yeah. Um, and like, this is what I'm talking about. And, and, and I, I know some people might hear this and get mad. Um, and I, I, and I don't like, I don't like that. I think this, <laughs> Um, and I don't like that, but I think it's true. Um, and, and then there are other Christian musicians, some of whom also will play, you know, at churches on Sundays and produce movies and pieces like this, that who are not copying mainstream. Um, they might be doing things parallel to mainstream. They might be in the mainstream. They might be pushing the narrative of the mainstream, um, and by mainstream, I'm, I'm, there's a bad choice of words. I really mean non-Christian spaces or non-explicitly Christian spaces, um, and are. I, don't know, I, I see somebody like Andrew Peterson. We're talking about Andrew Peterson today. Might as well just be explicitly clear with that. Andrew Peterson. If you listen to enough of his music, you know he's a Christian. Mm-hmm. It's just clear, um, right? We're talking this album is so clear about that. Um, but yeah. what he's doing is he's mixing he mixes bluegrass and folk and country and indie mm-hmm. um and like throws together those in the the same album <laughs> i don't know i i went on a little bit of a tirade um <laughs> what do you think oh boy There's so much, so much there. Uh, so many places to go. And people to see. People to see. I think those were Hershey Kisses. Mm. Bottom of the side. Not chocolate. Mm. Definitely going to have to stew on, on it more. I think the one of the difficult things about having a conversation about Christian art, and I think in genre in general, is that you kind of have to make generalizations, mm. and any generalization is going to be inaccurate. Yes, to a point, but at the same time, they can be helpful. And <laughs> what I find when I interact with Christian art is similar to your experience. Where very often, and and this is the generalization part, 
is this is what I encounter generally most of the time. The the lyrics are not so much with older hymns, but m more frequently with like contemporary Christian worship music. Lyrics are simple and not simple in that they they make me think and that they distill a complex thought in a, in a simple and interesting way but simple as in they don't really they don't they don't rock the boat um mm. you know they're very safe to say on a sunday they apply to they don't, all they don't, 50 you know, all the gen yeah. all the different denominations yeah, they they don't leave anyone with the, with a question mark, um, and you know they're not. No one's going to come up to the pastor after the service and you know have a have a concerning theological discussion with him. But um, and and to be honest, and and this I think is more a product of my own kind of journey with church and with the American church. Um, it, it doesn't do much for me in my own walk with Christ. It takes a lot of effort for me to get past the kind of artifice of the Christian song or whatever, mm -hmm. like the song that is particularly challenging to me is, is Holy Spirit is Holy is a pretty popular Spirit, one you are welcome and i gotta say come for this place yeah, please and stop. Feel the <laughs> please. no the, the holy spirit is not the puppy sorry <laughs> to be overcome <laughs> by your goodness um, the, the verses are fine like the bridge is good let us become more aware of your, your presence but it, it's like the the chorus just it just gets on my nerves because it's um and and the thing is is that if you listen to it in a church with with lots of people singing it it's it's beautiful you can kind of it feels like the presence of the of the spirit but the whole time I'm just thinking about how how little there is musically and how the lyrics are not really right like they're they're just kind of um I mean, sometimes, sometimes you need to sing. You need to make a, a, a strong statement that you can hold on to and understand. Mm. But at the same time, what I feel in Christian art, and especially in movies like like God's Not Dead or something, is that they put the simple, understandable. Um, kind of non mysterious message mm. at the front, and it it kind of sucks out all the mystery for me. Like, and God's not dead. They they, um, it's just a really weird movie uh, if you think about it. And we went and saw that together, didn't we? We did. Yeah, the, the Christian Fellowship. Um, <laughs> We went and saw it. We all had our thoughts. Yeah. Um, the plot is just, you know, but. Which, but, which plot? The one with the, the, this, the his wife, the name? Will students. Is it like, yeah. It, well, like there's a professor, the philosophy mm -hmm. professor who hates God mm -hmm. um, and tries to get all the students to say God's not dead, which is like. No, God is dead. Yeah, he tries it's, to say God is dead, and then there's one student who like won't sign the thing, which is like, I don't think even a philosophy professor who is an atheist that's like a like not I think great that's a philosophy. No -no. Yeah. Um, anyway, it's like you're leaving out like Augustine, and and I'm not philosopher by any means, but I know like there's some pretty heady stuff to get into with with it. But um, there's a lot of subplots in this movie. As yeah, well, yeah. So. But his like former student and they're like living together this professor and his former student are living together and and her big moment is saying like i think we're unequally yoked um and it's just like appropriating oh i don't i don't want to be too hard it's like 
what I'm trying to say, try, trying to bring <laughs> us back here. Please, is please that bring us back. In general, a lot of the Christian art that I encounter makes God too small. Mm. Hmm. It simplifies following God into a series of um, television plot points that you can follow. The yeah. Um, the 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 recognizing your need for a savior, praying the big prayer, maybe in front of a bunch of people. Oh my goodness. Um, as you're dying, as you're dying because you just got hit by a car. <laughs> um, well wow. said other yeah. character is coming. Defending to your, your faith in front of a philosophy class as a freshman at college. Um, like all of these, these giant moments that work well on a TV screen, but I have never encountered in my actual life, at least I've, I've had big moments and things, but, but like day to day faith is so much more, mm. you know, and it's so much more mysterious and, and, and wonderful and exciting than just these kind of uh, easily digestible moments that someone can look to and say, Oh yeah, he's a Christian. Um, and and that's that's what kind of it leaves me unsatisfied with with Christian art. It's not it's it's not necessarily um what it's what it's doing. It's what it's not doing, mm. um, which is kind of getting into the mystery and the the beauty of a God who is eternal and. Mm. Um, and eternally present. And eternally present. And who loves nuance and, and being creative and trying new things. Like, you just think about how many different um, species of insects there are. It's like, and, and I look at Christian music and it all sounds, most of it, most of it, generalization, it all sounds the same. A lot of it sounds the same to me. Um, but Andrew Peterson is is an exception and that's why we're talking about it yes it sounds like this is a conversation we're going to have to have more in in future episodes yeah um and there are pieces large pieces that we didn't bring up like it one of the reasons why many christian songs at tongue churches are very kind of simple in their language is to make them approachable to people who don't know the code of language in christian spaces yeah. Like they don't know, you know, and, and like, if you look at some of the history of one of the first hymns were sung, like they were sung by Christians pulling all nighters to protect their, their church um, building and body mm -hmm. from uh, Roman emperors, Roman emperor who was trying to build it, like burn it down. And so, and, and also hymns were used as a way to, to teach illiterate followers of Jesus about who Jesus was and to proclaim together um, about the goodness of God. Um, and so there's all these really amazing nuances that are, are even in the history of Christian music. Yeah. Um, and, and this is also part of a larger um, movement that's happened in, in the United States, especially of um, evangelical Christians away from mainstream and then trying to create a parallel almost universe or culture of of art to, well, it's to an alternative to, yeah um and there are some really good parts about that and there's some really challenging and and rough parts about that as well yeah um, and so i just want to call if, before we move on and, and we definitely got to move on um i was talking generally more about more contemporary art like Christian art, um, I love old hymns. Um, partly, a lot of because of what you were talking about with the history of of old hymns, and um, I I get more out of the lyrics of old hymns. Honestly, um, were you raised on old hymns? Uh, I wouldn't say I was raised on it. Our church did do hymns regularly, but. I was also exposed to a lot of the, the contemporary Christian music 
mm-hmm. when I was younger too. But, there is a thing to be said about what you were most used to being something yeah. that you hold as being more important. And it might be that both of us have fallen into certain camps towards that too. Yeah. I um, mean, you, I was very dogmatic about music. Um, in the middle school, high school, I'm, I'm less, I'm more open now, but uh, basically I just listened to classic rock and blues in high school. Okay. And almost nothing. Hunter, else. anything else you want to say before we dive into actually talking about what we are here to talk about today? I'm sorry for talking too much. <laughs> Same here. Um, this is clearly a nerve that we've, we've talked about pretty often together. And, and again, we'll come up more. Um, I want to bring us back to Behold the Lamb of God because it it not only acts against what you were just saying and what we were just talking about, it simultaneously works against the narrative uh, throughout our country about Christmas music. Um, I... I, I I've been calling it a Christmas album. Um, I have never thought about it as a Christmas album until today. I was reading somebody's write write up on it from 18 years ago when it first came out about it being a Christmas album. And I always think about it as an Advent album. I don't think of any other Advent albums, but like, it's not, it's not a group of songs that like you could compare to um, Jingle Bells or Michael Buble or Mariah Carey um, (laughs) or Dolly Parton or, any of these other, you know, peop- pentatonics, um, like all of whom have done incredibly, really interesting music. I mean, the Guardians of the Galaxy special has a couple uh, uh, by the 97s, uh, a couple new Christmas music pieces that I think are hilarious and awesome. Um, but there, there's no comparison as well um, of this to those. Uh, right, the only overlap of song is "O Come, O Come, Emmanuel," and we already talked about that. Like, it is entirely instrumental, and it comes about it is a fifth out of the twelve songs. Um, and so, under one of the things that is true about this album for me, um, which is untrue of most other albums, and we've talked about this in a previous episode, is I nine times out of ten. We'll listen to this first song to, to last song. Um, and if I stop at some point in the 42 or 43 minutes of the album running time, I'll, I'll pick up from where I stopped or I'll go back to the beginning. Hmm. Um, I might replay certain songs. Um, and we'll talk about my favorite song, which I know you know. Um, and all of you have heard at this point. Um, <laughs> it, But it's it's... It's telling the story of Jesus and it's telling the story, the story of Christmas. And it doesn't start. And I already said this once on this episode, but it doesn't start with Jesus's birth. Mm. Right. It has this song that, that, that I just love it. It's it's again, I was reading this from somebody else. And so I can't claim it, but like, it's like the idea of like a grandparent calling their grandkids together. Right, mm. gather round, ye children, come, listen to the old old story. Like, if you please listen to this album uh, after this episode, um, it'll be in our program in in the program notes. Oh my goodness, <laughs> <laughs> we would have had to prepare a lot more for this to be called a program. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, we've already talked longer than um, the album has gone on. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. It's it's so incredible, and like it starts by bringing people together, right? It, it I'm moving to this arm movement, of like motion of like come yeah. together, um, and then it dives into the story. And like I don't want to say what every song does, even though I I would gladly do that, and I would gladly talk with anybody at length about this, um, right? But like it's it's. It, it tells the story by itself, right? The, mm-hmm. I, I, I still remember the feeling I had when I first listened to, like, had a real listen to this, um, like an intentional listen, like you were saying, Hunter. Mm-hmm. It, it, you feel it because all of us, for me, it was a, oh, 
you're right. The Christmas story isn't, doesn't start when Mary gets pregnant. And it yeah. doesn't start when Mary gets pregnant because, and, 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 and uh, Andrew Peterson actually talks about this in the, um, the live recording he does of this um, every year. Um, which I missed. It was yesterday. There was a you could spend twenty twenty dollars to do a um, to live stream um, the the concert uh, being held um, in Nashville mm. uh, at the Ryman Auditorium, which he does every year. Mm. Um, I missed it. It was yesterday. I was so angry about that. Um, but the the album, it, it just it causes you to to take a step back and it caused me and it, it continually causes me to take a step back to quiet my heart and to think about the larger span and, and really the, the point of the Bible, All right? The Bible is among other things, a combination of stories that are purposely brought together to point to a central moment in history. And that central moment is a th- it takes 33 years mm. and nine months. And it starts with the birth of Jesus and it ends with his death and resurrection. And the, even the particular moment where Jesus is, when Jesus is born, in Jewish history is so crucial, right? The fourth song talks about that. Deliver us. It's, it's a period of waiting. Was it 400 years? I think it is of waiting and not hearing anything from God, right? The time of the prophets is over and you're just waiting like, God, when are you going to come and deliver for deliver us? Right, our enemy, our captor, is no Pharaoh on the Nile, on the Nile. Like we are past the exilic period. Right, we're past the time of exile. Um, sorry, we're past our time as slaves in Egypt. They dwell in their own land. And yet they're calling out to Yahweh to deliver us. They're in what is called the exilic period. Um, I think that's the right wording uh, with, under, under Babylon. And, and then following this, this cry to asking God to deliver them, there's O come, O come, Emmanuel. And like the decision that Peterson dec- makes to, to make it completely instrumental, like speaks to that time of silence, time of God, are you going to answer? Like, what are you going to say? And we know the song, right? And this, these are my thoughts on this. This is, this is my understanding <laughs> of it. And so I might be completely off, um, but we've talked about that again on a previous episode about who commands the story, who gets to, mm-hmm. right. Who, who, who uh, you know, or <laughs> does it, and you know, you're, you're listening to us. So sorry about that. Um, <laughs> Like we as listeners hear O come, O come, Emmanuel, and we're like, oh, it's coming, it's coming, Jesus is coming, it's coming. Um, but if you don't know that song, you're just and and, and the you know the the Israelites <laughs> didn't. <laughs> They're just sitting there waiting, crying out in pain, and yet God's like, oh, do you hear that? That's me, right? That's my son. Mm. And that leads into uh, the sixth song, which there's 12 songs on this album. The sixth song is my favorite. Because it leads into what are the first words of the New Testament. Uh, And they are words that people skip over so often. And it's almost verbatim, not quite verbatim, but almost verbatim of the first 16 verses of 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 Matthew chapter one, and it's not verbatim because the very very beginning of it, um, I think Matthew one says like then this is the line of Jesus from Abraham to this is me trying to think about that, but um, mm-hmm. but then it talks about the genealogy of Jesus, 
And the first time I ever heard this was actually before I ever was introduced to Andrew Peterson. Uh, my church played this. Actually, I think they might have done the entire album in 2012 or somewhere on there. And I was just blown away by this bluegrass song <laughs> with this fun bass part. I was just singing the names of Jesus, uh, Jesus' uh, <laughs> ancestors. And I have spent a lot of time in Matthew chapter 1. Um, one of the ways in which Andrew Peterson, Behold the Lamb of God, has shaped me, I actually put forth the idea and then co like planned, co-planned a four-part sermon series for a multi-site church you know that represented thousands of people throughout Chicago <laughs> based off of <laughs> Matthew chapter 1 verses 1 to 16 mm. because the way in which the author of Matthew tells the de genealogy matters Right. It matters the names that are brought in here, uh, both historically, uh, but then also like there, there are specific decisions that are made. Um, at that time, genealogies wouldn't include the name of women. And yet, um, I think it's three separate times Matthew brings up women's names. Um, Matthew specifically brings up the, like almost the, um, what's the right wording? Uh, the scandals in the lineage of Jesus, as well as the kingly yeah. lineage. But like, it's just, oh, and, and, he, and the, the song is done in such a way that's, it's just fun. Mm -hmm. It gets you moving. Um, and then following the pattern, I said, I wasn't going to walk through the whole album. I'm doing it. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, of of walking through scripture kind of chronologically up to Jesus's birth. It goes to this, this next song, it came to pass, uh, which talks about the census that was taken. Um, and the, the second verse is really funny in the beginning. And it came to pass. This man named Joe was with his fiance. When her pregnancy began to show, he planned to go away, but it came to pass that in a dream, an angel of the Lord, said joseph don't you be afraid to marry mary for um and it just and it's just quoting scripture um but like how fun is like to talk about joseph as, as a man named joe um <laughs> and then it dives into jesus's birth and like uh to specifically counter uh a, a christmas song that i love I, I, you know um Oh, oh no! Oh, oh, sorry. Silent night, holy night. Right, um, song "Silent Night." That was the is a song, a labor of love. Um, both of us have kids. Mm. Um, the song's much more accurate <laughs> <laughs> to the reality of having a child. Um, again, neither of us gave birth. Both of our yeah, <laughs> um, and it's. It's also, uh, this was one of the songs that I highlighted, I starred, because um, <clears throat> I think what is not emphasized as much in the Christmas story is Herod's reaction to the news that there is going to be a king in Jerusalem uh, brought to him by the, the wise men. Um, at the time of Jesus' birth, Herod is afraid because he is, is currently ruling over, uh, the, the Jews in this district at this point. And, and Eric, you can help me out here with my, my Bible history, but Herod sends out <laughs> a decree to kill all of the males under two, I think. I think it's that, yeah. Um, Born in the Bethlehem area. Yeah, in Bethlehem. I'll say that again. He sends he sends a decree to kill all of the males under two. 
all of them in Bethlehem. And that is a um, detail that I have just stared at in the gospel and in, in scripture for a long while, just thinking about, um, I believe it might be in Isaiah or something. There's multiple references about um, a sound of weeping was heard. Um, mm. Great sound of lament. And even before I had my own son, <laughs> um, he's over two at this point, but it's it's almost unimaginable. And this this great amount of the song is called "Labor of Love," not just not just the pain that Mary went through um, in in labor and you know in circumstance. Uh, in the manger and, and everything, the desperation of that circumstance, but also just the, the the death of all of these children. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I think about like the guards going, who, who are carrying out these orders. Mm. Like it's just in this song. This song um, dives into that. And where, where do you see it diving into that? Um, I guess I think about it was not a silent night. There was blood on the ground. You could hear a woman cry in the alleyways that night in the streets of Davidstown. I, I've always read that as, or listened to that as just like the specific aspect of Mary's birth. Uh, uh, of Jesus. Um, but I, I think that what you're talking about is also accurate. Um, yeah. Maybe that's just me reading into it because I've thought about that detail a lot. Mm -hmm. And I, the first time I heard that those words, I was like, Oh, it must be talking about this. Yeah. Um, well, and, and, yeah. and I don't think it's not, um, I, yeah. I haven't felt that or I haven't heard that even though yeah, I know the past Matthew two, I think it's 12 to 16. 16 to 18 talks about that. Um, yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's a song that makes you feel like you can't escape that. And it's followed again by an instrumental song. Mm -hmm. And then the shepherds hear the story. Is is there more you want to share about that particular song? I mean, I, I think that. No, no, I, I can see how my interpretation is. I don't know. It's very particular to me, but yeah. Um, I I think it you, what you're talking about though still captures the emotion. Yeah. Of that, of the song. And it is a song that will, like, it forces you to be silent. <laughs> and, and again, one of the things I love about the album um, is Andrew Peterson isn't the one singing a lot of these songs. Yeah. Even though he co-wrote and co-produced and, you know, many of these pieces, like, he's not, he's not the one singing labor of love. It's not a guy singing about <laughs> the labor of love, <laughs> which I love. <laughs> and then that matters, right? It's, it it's a certainly does. And, you know, I, my experience when my son was born was very different than my wife's, <laughs> even though I was by her side the whole time. And I wish I could take her pain. Um, you know, and I'm sure many, many fathers have felt that, mm -hmm. um, that uselessness and that anticipation and that worry and that heart, you know, love, um, watching somebody you love so much go through such a painful process for such a wonderful 
and life changing and life giving <laughs> moment. Um, like, like while shepherds watched, it's what the second to last song or the third to last song. It's it's the story, right? We all know about this, right? Angels, you and the shepherds, whatever, whatever. Right, that's the song, right? Yeah, Is I was also right thinking, one? "Hark the Herald Angels Sing." That's what I was trying to think. I, man, I haven't listened to enough Christmas music this year. Um, but like, it it tells that story differently. Um. It doesn't tell a different story. It just tells it in a different way. Yeah. Um, and then behold the lamb. Um, it, this is, ah, behold the lamb of God who takes away our sin. Behold the lamb of God, the life and light of man, men. Behold the lamb of God who died and rose again. Behold the lamb of God who take comes to take away our sin. Mm. Ah, it, it, it's, um, it, I don't know how you get clearer than that. And then the, the whole album yeah. ends with the theme of my song, which. It weaves all of the melodies and lyrics of previous songs all into one big um, yearning finale. And it doesn't three minutes. It, it's. Yeah. It, the the album begins with like a, a call to worship <laughs> and it ends with a benediction. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it's like, come like, let me like sit around and then go forth. Like, remember, like, <laughs> remember and believe. Yeah. I, I listen to this song, this album, like I said, every day or almost every day. Because it gives me hope, um, and when I have hit points in my life where I've had major levels of panic and anxiety, um, which has happened um, not all that often, but has happened uh, at different points, this is an album I'll go to, whether it's winter, spring, summer, or fall. Um, and I'll lie in bed, go for a walk, or curl up in the shower um, mm. with this album going on. Um, because one of the things that it does so well is it speaks truth. It speaks truth over you. And and I think that's true of a lot of contemporary worship music as well. Is it mm. speaks truth over you. Um, but this this album, for many of the reasons I've already shared, and many other reasons I haven't, and might not ever fully understand, um, it's just it washes over me with the truth of who Jesus is, and that from even before mankind sinned and put its ourselves in a space where we couldn't be in the presence of God, God had a plan. From the time when the chosen people of God were enslaved, God had a plan. From the time when the Israelites had their own land and had received another covenant from God and were beginning to, to slay spotless lambs, in anticipation of the lamb who would be slain and in response to the spotless lamb who was to be slain to, for Passover, God had a plan. And Jesus is throughout this album, the lamb of God. And And that's from the beginning. 
And we know that that's true about who Jesus is. Uh, That's one of the ways that Jesus is talked about from Genesis to Revelation. And it's no, it's no coincidence. And it's so rare for me to, to interact with and to hear an album that not only grabs my attention, but tells a complete story. Right through like any of these songs, if you lost one of these songs, like the album would be less. Um, and it, it tells a complete story that says, "No, we're being yeah, it, we're being told that the beginning of Jesus was the moment he was born." No, it goes back before that, and it's not just to the time where. Joseph, a man named Joe, found out that his fiance was pregnant and decided, you know what? Like the angel of the Lord came to me, like, I'm going to stay with you. No. Mm -hmm. Uh, Even though he had full right to divorce her, which would have been the case in that day and was expected, uh, if not more. Um, And it says, like, no, no, no. And we're going to go back further than that. And it's not just to the beginning of the, the first chapter of Matthew, right? It's, 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 it says, no, we're going to go before. It's not just to win. You know, the people of, of God were like crying out for the Savior. That's like, no, no. It's not just when Joshua and Moses before him, you know, were there. And it's not, you know, it, it, it pulls you back. And it says, God had a plan. And like each song, I mean, songs by themselves are like miniature stories. Uh, and every so often you can interact with a group of songs or you know, just like maybe often a group of poems that act as chapters in a book or as scenes in a movie, um, but do something for you that, that chapters in a book and scenes in a movie can't do or don't do or do differently because of the medium in which it's told. Concept album. Yeah. It's the second concept album we've talked about on this uh, podcast. Oh, yeah. What was the first? Midnight's. Midnight's. Oh, yeah. It is. It is. It, it, that's a full-on yeah. concept album. Um, the 3 AM specials, too. And we also talked about your, con- your, your concept album that you're working on. Right. <laughs> From there. <laughs> Yeah. Um, do you have any anything you want to share or questions or thoughts that around this album particularly before we might touch base on a different Andrew Peterson song or two? Um, I think you said it best. Um, this is a. A beautiful concept album about the Lamb of God that goes maybe not to completely uncharted territory in the in Christmas music, um, but it does it in a way that it hasn't been done before, and it does it in a fun and creative, thoughtful. Um, beautiful way and it's woven together and it's a complete Mm. experience woven together i like Mm. that and it's 18 years old and it's still being performed live every year yeah right it's 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 an album that i i've heard people bring up to me like oh have you heard this it's like yeah Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) i brought that up to somebody once like have you heard this he's like a friend and he's like yeah, I've, I've known about it for like 15 years. It's like, <laughs> but it's so new. It's so fresh. It's so... Because <laughs> yeah. it doesn't age. <laughs> yeah, I think that's... Um, that's uh, if, if there's one concrete characteristic that you can give to great heart, it's that it doesn't age. Mm. It feels fresh. That's what I find about Don Quixote, which is... Mm-hmm. From the 1600s. And it, Michael brought us into that point about Macbeth last week, too. Right, yeah. Ah, 
listen to the album. Listen to Behold the Lamb of God. It, you will not disappoint. Buy it. Um, get it on Spotify. Buy an album. Buy, buy a vinyl of it. Um, you can get it also on Hoopla. You can rent it. Uh, Hoopla is a app you can get through your local library. You can you can rent music and do uh, it movies and stuff. And if you if you dislike it uh, or love it or have any questions, feel free to message me. Uh, if you don't know how to message me, then uh, message Hunter, <laughs> and he'll he'll message me. If you don't yeah. know how to message either of us, uh, go to Discord. I don't know. So, oh, yeah, I wouldn't do my Discord. No. Um, no, not a not a message space. Yeah, I'm a I'm I'm a, I'm on Mastodon. Um, Mastodon. Yeah, if you go to my website, right dot as slash h dancing, you can click on the about, and there's my Mastodon and Twitter. Um. And those are like the ways to at me. <laughs> Not many people do, so I'll probably read it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I if would love to play this album through someday. I think this would be so much fun to do. Hmm. To like perform it? To perform the album. Yeah. Well, we got one song down. Yeah, we do. More or we less. Do. Yeah. <laughs> we've been talking for a while hunter yeah andy peterson has a lot of other art out there and and stories um we were talking about in the night uh he does a lot of different albums he also is a an author um, oh. did you know that about him no he has written a group of uh stories um middle 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 school aged Mm -hmm. um called the wing feather saga saga Mm -hmm. um i have not yet read them it's on my list it is um something that i want to share with my son um this is something i didn't share about this album this was the first album i had my son listen to I mean, he was either weeks or I think it was weeks, maybe days old. We listened to this together. Um, like that's how important this is to me. Yeah. Um, and how much I want him to be raised with um, not only st- like storytelling, um, but with the storytelling <laughs> <laughs> um, or a story about the storyteller. So uh, that's another aspect of of this uh, this album, but also of Andrew Peterson. Um, Andrew Peterson, in, <clears throat> sorry, is also a large part of the Rabbit Room, um, uh, which is a music story and art community that. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was based off of the the name of the back room of the pub where Lewis, Tolkien, and Charles Williams shared their stories. Mm-hmm. They do annual conferences. I love all of Andrew, everything of Andrew Peterson's I've listened to and everything that Andrew Peterson's music has led me to. Um, I, there's an, uh, last, I this, listened to a Spotify playlist of last year's rabbit room, like different mm-hmm. artists on it. And I was introduced to a lot of artists I had, I didn't know about. And it was fascinating. And I, I was able to learn and listen to music that I otherwise wouldn't have known about um, because of, uh, because of Andrew Peterson um, and, and where it led. So things you might not know. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, my absolute favorite Andrew Peterson song is in the night. That was my first introduction to Andrew Peterson. 
um, and it's still my favorite. Um, and the first verse is just, I am weary with the pain of Jacob's wrestling, in the darkness with the fear, in the darkness with the fear. But he met the morning wounded with a blessing. So in the night, my hope lives on. And this is a song, I think, um, similar to what you said, that when I feel um, what Steinbeck once called the world sadness um, hmm. pressing down and everything gets darker, um, this is one of the songs that I come to. Um, hmm. Is in the night my hope lives on. And it's not just his lyrics, his, his, I love his voice too. I, he's got a good voice. Yeah. He's got, I mean, which isn't a surprise, right? He's you know, a musician and, and you know, Nashville guy. And, um, yeah. He brings in a violin and harmonica and, um, real, real blues, bluegrass feel. Um, it's really nice to listen to. Mm -hmm. I have dreamed about doing a rock and roll cover of In the Night. Um, oh, that'd be cool. Yeah. Kind of the opposite side of things, right? Usually you hear a uh, acoustic cover of songs. Yeah. yeah. Um, what, what was the one we shared about at one time? I was sharing with you of... Um... Oh, that's my son. <laughs> Why are you awake? We shared the... The Sound of Silence by Disturbed. Right, yeah. Uh, which I think is an incredible cover of it. I mean, it's not as good as the original thing, but it's it's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, one of my favorite, probably one of my favorite um, Andrew Peterson songs is, well, there's so many of them, but is Dancing in the Minefields, which I sang a little bit earlier. Yeah. And it's like, I, I, I listen to it as like the story of him and his wife. Yeah. Let's go dancing in the minefields. Let's go sailing in the storms. Oh, this is harder than we dreamed, but I believe that's what the promise is for. And that's what the promise is for. You can't go wrong. Um, it's surprisingly enough, the one uh, Andrew Peter song, song that I connect with the least is the one that I am most uniquely connected to hmm. he has a song that's specifically about the isle of sky oh. which is a specific space in scotland um that's in that's stunning and i've been to and i love hmm. it and for whatever reason i just can't connect with that particular song um <laughs> which is strange because i'm like i feel like this should be the exact song that i love um so yeah it's weird when you get People like recommend things to you. You have every reason to like, but you just don't. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's uh, mysterious. Um, well, any any final words? Give Matthews Begats a good old try. Uh, it's it's hokey. Uh, it's fun. Um, yeah, there's a lot. Things that are written in the Bible aren't written on accident. There's, there's, there's so much behind the words, um, history, you know, some poor scribe, like copying manuscripts on a bumpy road. <laughs> um, like, and, and and I think what's what's beautiful about music is that it takes what you might just just glance over in a sentence, and it expands it and gives you space to to meditate on it, uh, mm -hmm. and and what it what it means, and I'll unpack everything. 
Um, and much better than we could do on this podcast. So that's true. Go listen. Yeah. Maybe we should have just played it instead of hearing us talk. But we did sing it. So that's true. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening. If you're still here. Um, yeah. Really, I I hope it was enjoyable. Yeah, Hunter, we're still working on this this album piece. I mean, the podcast as a whole, but all the the albums are they're challenging uh, in a different way. Yeah, um, than some of the other types of stories and we talk about. Um, but thank you for for intentionally listening to my yeah. favorite album. Um, I'm glad to hear that you uh, that it hit you. Um, yeah. Thank you for um, making me listen intentionally. <laughs> that is the joy of this podcast, right? We get to yeah. force each other yep. to listen to, and partake in things that that mean a lot, a great deal to us. Yeah. <laughs> We're given the the goodbye head nod. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> I just found another tumbleweed. <laughs> you don't die in any, you can just change it. That too.